warm welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Tony. I'm an assistant dean in Hofstra University School of Health Professions and Human Services, and welcome to this afternoon's event, Understanding Suicide Causes and Prevention. This virtual event is being offered as a part of our 2021 National Public Health Week event series, and it is being co-sponsored and facilitated by Diana Rizzo, who is a project manager with CN Guidance and Counseling Services. Very excited to hear about all that Diana is going to be discussing today. And it is my absolute pleasure to ask Diana, the virtual floor is yours to take over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I really am so happy to be here uh, presenting at this event. I don't think I realized that I was the, you know, the last presentation, so that's exciting. I uh, thank everyone for being here. Uh, like Tony mentioned, please feel free to turn on your camera if you wish to do so. Uh, suicide is a very heavy topic, so sometimes uh, seeing other faces and just gauging how everyone is doing is really helpful. Uh, and I have found through all the trainings I've done, it, it's been really helpful for everyone who's involved. Um, I'm gonna head right into the PowerPoint slide. Uh, quickly about me, I guess, like Tony mentioned, I, I'm overseeing a suicide prevention grant at CN Guidance. I'll go over the exact title in a moment, but I do have experience in the OPWDD field, as well as OMH and substance abuse, and I have been in the field for about 18 years at this point. So there's a lot of background knowledge uh, that I've, I'm bringing into this presentation. So please feel free to ask any questions as they come about unmute and talk to me or write it in the chat and Tony will help me uh, oversee that because I don't always pay attention when I'm talking. <laughs> All right, so here we go. As Tony had mentioned, this is the Understanding Suicide Causes and Prevention. This is an overview presentation. I will go through towards the end of my slides, the next steps that you might wanna take after hearing some of this information to say, well, what do I do now when I'm noticing these warning signs and risk factors and how do I talk to somebody? There are definitely other trainings that I personally can provide you uh, that would help you do that. So. I get to be here with you today, both for the Hofstra event and because of the grant that CN Guidance has received. It's a federally funded grant from SAMHSA, which stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And it's the COVID-19 Emergency Response for Suicide Prevention Grant, or as we've titled it, Empower Life on Long Island. I don't expect anyone to remember that huge title. You can just say the CNG Suicide Prevention Grant. That's us. And my contact information is all throughout the presentation if anyone wants to reach out to me for any reason. A few things. Uh, the discussion today is gonna focus on adults and how suicide impacts adults. You can certainly ask questions about youth or teens if that comes up as well. Um, in general, it is also an epidemic for any age and it, also has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, not just adults, also our teens and children. A few things before I get into this topic. Suicide is extremely serious and it can be very triggering for a lot of us. So if you need to step away at any point during the presentation, I definitely understand. Please come back as soon as you can. Um, but as I go through the statistics, we will realize that many of us on this call right now and at this presentation have been touched by suicide personally, professionally, uh, family members. So I do understand if what we're talking about can be triggering at times. I also ask that you forgive yourself. If you have lost anyone to suicide in the past or have struggled with thoughts you know, on your own and didn't ask for help, please don't take any information that I present today and apply it to your past and beat yourself up about it. That's not what this is about. This is about moving forward and doing better tomorrow. I, I like to say during my trainings that we are human beings just doing the best we can each and every day with the information that we have, both for ourselves and our loved ones, and that's all we're doing, right? So don't take information today and apply it to yesterday. Last thing, laughter is okay. If you laugh at me, it's fine. I laugh at myself. It's not gonna demean the topic that we're talking about or be disrespectful to anyone who's struggling with suicide, but I flub up my words, I move the slides too fast. We might talk about something that makes you giggle. It's okay. 
Laughter is medicine, it's a coping mechanism, and it's totally fine. So this grant came about at the beginning of the pandemic. It was already seen that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was affecting us with isolation and everything else and was exacerbating some mental health uh, symptoms already. So we're gonna go through this as we go through each slide. Okay, so here I have a meme that I found um, on Instagram. I won't lie about it, I didn't create it, I found this. And it just struck me. This is what depression looks like. Now all these people on this slide are famous people. They are talented people. They were beautiful, handsome, right? They were actors, funniest guy in the room, so smart. How could these people be thinking about suicide or die by suicide or be depressed when they have everything that they wanted? Depression and thoughts of suicide are not based in logic. They are based in mental and emotional pain. Just because someone looks on the outside to be the happiest person you've ever seen does not necessarily mean that that's what's going on on the inside. So that's what I want to keep in mind is that we can't always say, oh, this person's not thinking about suicide. They look so happy. They're fine every day. They're going to work every day. There are things going on underneath the surface that we don't know until we start asking questions or still we, until we look at the finer points of what's going on with the person. I do also want to take note that most of the people on this slide, all but one, are white males. And that is actually indicative of the statistics for those who die by suicide. Unfortunately, the highest risk group for people who die by suicide are white males of working age, so 35 to 65. So that does show in this representation that this is an accurate picture. But also to put a little more information out there, there are additional celebrities that we know by name who openly talk about struggling with depression. Some are Katy Perry, Lady Gaga is very outspoken about her mental health. Uh, Wayne Brady has also talked about it recently, Jim Carrey, Terry Bradshaw. And one that I was actually surprised about was Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. He speaks, uh, spoke about struggling with depression, I think almost about a year ago, and actually discussed that when he was 15, he saved his mother from a suicide attempt. So I bring this up because suicide does not designate one group of people to go after. It is all over. It's not just celebrities. It's not just people in low socioeconomic status, one culture, one group. It's across the board. Another thing I wanna point out is, again, we're talking about celebrities. There's a high level of creativity, um, intelligence that a lot of what these people do, and something called presenteeism. So just because someone's always out there and always with other people and never alone, that doesn't mean they're okay. That act actually might indicate the opposite. So we're gonna go through some risk factors and warning signs. These are just a little teaser, because when we see faces that we know, it sometimes becomes a little more jarring and shocking that, oh my gosh, these people were suffering and nobody knew about it. Here's some statistics for New York for 2020. So these are the statistics for New York State. 1,723 people died in New York State from suicide in 2020. It's the 12th leading cause of death. Suicide each year is always somewhere between the 10th or 12th leading cause of death, depending on what else was going on that year. But let's also look at the national number. We're talking about over 48,000 people. Now, to give you a perspective on that, we're talking about filling Yankee Stadium seating with 48,000 people. I think it seats up to like 53 or something. 48,000 of them are filled with souls who we have lost to suicide. Suicide is the most preventable cause of death. And recovery is possible. But people don't always realize that. So to give you another picture, 5% of Americans are thinking about suicide right now. That's one in 20 people. We have 25 people right now at this event. At least one of us is thinking about suicide. I say that at every training, at everything I do, and when I can see the faces, people go, uh-uh, oh, because oh. usually it's an emergency or and everybody knows each other, and that's scary to think that you could see 20 people on one day and at least one of them is thinking about suicide. And what that translates to is that at this moment, 16,500,000 people are thinking about suicide. 
So when we think it's not appropriate to ask the question, just remember these numbers, right? The thoughts of suicide are more common than we like to realize because it's scary. But the, the more we can normalize these thoughts and the more that we can reduce the stigma around it, the more that we can prevent it. So while we're on this call, let's also keep in mind that one suicide is happening every 11 seconds. We're losing somebody. Uh, 11 minutes, I do that all the time. One every 11 minutes, not seconds. That's even scarier, I don't wanna do that. One every 11 minutes. Okay, so we're gonna go into some definitions and terminology now so that we understand what we're all talking about. We realize that there is a depth to suicide. It's not straightforward. Hopefully that's what you guys get out of today. It doesn't look one way for everyone. Suicide looks different for everyone. It's a different journey, it's a different path. But to give it some uh, definitions to help us talk about this, suicide is violence against oneself with the intent of our own death resulting in a fatal outcome. I use the word violence because that's truly what it is. A suicide attempt is violence against oneself with the intent of our own death that results in a non-fatal outcome. Now, a suicide attempt can occur because someone interrupted someone's attempt, uh, the person was able to stop themselves, but that's still an attempt and that's still something that needs to be talked about very seriously. So there's different types of attempts and I have, to under, I have to be honest, that's not something that I realized until I started really researching suicide and what was going on with, with us as human beings. So there's a first degree attempt, which is planned, deliberate and premeditated. This is when you're gonna see people uh, getting ready to die, giving things away. It's called preparatory behavior, right? They're maybe writing a suicide note. Even though, to be honest, suicide notes are not as common as our movies and television shows would like us to believe, they're actually not very often left. Um, and unfortunately, that impacts everyone who's left behind to try to figure out what happened. Um, but giving things away, getting their personal affairs in order, maybe picking you know, what, how they want their funeral to be set up. Uh, so that's the first degree. That's when someone is really thinking about it, getting it ready, knows how they would do it. And they've been thinking about it a long time. Second degree is impulsive or unplanned, and it's not as well thought out. So that can be someone who seems okay, and then one day they're not here. Maybe they weren't thinking about it as much, and something was the straw that broke the camel's back. Third degree is when a person deliberately puts his or herself in a dangerous situation so that they might die. The intent is not always clear, so a lot of times these would be uh, ruled as accidental deaths, maybe not a suicide. So I also want you to keep that in mind from the statistics I provided. Statistics are only as good as the information that goes into it, right? After someone has unfortunately died, we don't know what was going on just prior to that. So the third degree is also intentional life-threatening behavior. So that could be someone stop taking medication that they need to remain alive or continuing to drink alcohol uh, when they have cirrhosis of the liver driving their car extremely fast without their seatbelt on on a rainy day, maybe hoping that they get into an accident, uh, excessively using drugs or alcohol, not caring if the ultimate outcome is that they end their life. Any questions so far? Or are we? I do see one in the chat, Diana. Okay. Uh, the question appears to read, is that why the English categorize, is that what the, is that what the English categorize as death by misadventure? I have not heard that term, but that would make sense. That's a new term to be death by misadventure. I haven't seen that. I'm writing it down. You learn new things every day. Adventure. Okay. I would assume it sounds kind of similar to that terminology, but I'm going to have to look that up. Thank you. Um, there's also, I, I thought you were going to say death by cop, because that is another thing that comes up. Some people who intentionally kind of get in trouble and pretend maybe that they have a gun or something else and then force someone else to take their life. Something else come in? Uh, the person who asked the question says thank you. Oh, okay. You're welcome. <laughs> 
Okay, so next is just changes and updates to our terminology. So far yet, you guys have not heard me say committed suicide because we are moving away from that terminology. Um, committed sounds very derogatory. It connotates a lot of blame for the person who has died. Um, when hopefully what you'll get from this presentation is a lot of people who land on the decision to take their own lives are struggling. They are in pain, emotional and mental pain, and they are done. All they want is for that pain to end. It is a last ditch effort to feel better, right? So for me, that doesn't feel like a commitment. That feels like I just can't do this anymore. So we don't say committed suicide. We also don't say um, successful suicide. That was kind of out for a little while. This can lead one to believe that it's something that you want to you want to achieve and that if someone did not die, they're a failure. A lot of times teens, when this uh, kind of terminology was out, I was reading that teenagers responded very neg negatively to that saying, oh, see, I can't even kill myself right. You know, I, I couldn't even do that right. I can't do anything right. I'm a failure. And that almost continued those thoughts of, of saying, I'm going to do it right next time and then making another attempt. So we are not using that terminology anymore. We're saying things like completed suicide, died by suicide. I say victim of suicide uh, most often when I'm aware that someone is living with thoughts of suicide day in and day out because that person is a victim of their own brain trying to kill them. And that's actually the name of a book, How I Stayed Alive and My Brain Was Trying to Kill Me. You'll see that on my slide later. So victim of suicide or uh, the last two there are suicide survivor or survivor of suicide. And that kind of has a dual meaning. It refers to both people who have made a suicide attempt and are living after that attempt and working to stay alive every day. Or it's also for the family, friends, and loved ones who have been severely impacted by somebody that they lost. Because for any of us who have lost someone by suicide, you know that your days after you have lost that person, you're sitting there wondering, what could I have done differently? How could I have changed this? Could I have done something? Could I have said something? What if, what if, what if? So you are a survivor because you are dealing with those thoughts and feelings every day. So when in doubt, we're doing our best to use person first language, right? We've done that in most other fields that we're working in. We don't say drug addict any, anymore. We say someone addicted to a substance. Uh, OPWDD also changed that uh, a long time ago as well. So instead of not saying that suicidal person is, is an extremely negative thing to say, but we do try to say things like a person struggling with suicidal thoughts or behaviors or a person experiencing a suicide crisis. I also want to make it clear that someone can either live with thoughts of suicide on a daily basis. Most often that happens when someone is diagnosed with a mental illness such as depression or bipolar disorder, or it can be situational based. So I think you guys are going to see that in this next slide. Uh, more clearly through the risk factors, because sometimes there are external situations that can lead someone to feel like they are stuck in a corner, they're backed into a corner and there's no other way out. They just, they have to die. It's a self-imposed death sentence. No one else is telling them that they have to die, but that is how they feel. If I can't get out of this legal trouble, I'm going to kill myself. If my wife leaves me, I'm going to kill myself, okay? So just keep that in mind. There are multiple avenues and multiple journeys that can lead someone to these thoughts. And these are some of those paths that they can take to get there. So alcohol and substance abuse is a clear uh, danger zone for someone who is struggling. And mental illness, depression or hopelessness. I'm going to stay with those three for a moment because the three of those put together um, are what's known as the deadly triad. So alcohol or substances, a lethal means, oops, where's that one? That one's in there too. Um, having access to a lethal means and mental illness or distress, that's the deadly triad. So if someone's already struggling, now you add a substance that's altering their brain chemistry and now you have access to lethal means. That's what leads to the second degree suicide attempts that are impulsive. So to give you some statistics to back that up, Anyone who's diagnosed with an alcohol abuse disorder dies with alcohol in their system if, when it's by suicide 80% of the time. Someone who's not diagnosed with any 
alcohol or substance abuse disorder still will die with alcohol 60% of the time if they die by suicide. So still alcohol is playing a huge role in decreasing those inhibitions, increasing that impulsivity, liquid courage, right? So you're no longer worried or thinking about that this is permanent when you use this lethal means to end your life. You're not coming back from this. That's it. So keep that in mind. I, I bring that up a lot when it has to do with the alcohol because through this grant, as you see the services we provide, I have had people tell me, oh, but she only thinks about suicide when she's drinking. That's, that's a huge problem. That's scary. That is a dangerous time to be thinking about that. So even if someone's not thinking about when they're not drinking, if they are, very dangerous and definitely need help. Domestic violence is a huge situation, especially during COVID. I don't know about you guys, but I was lucky to be stuck at home with my wonderful family who gave me that silver lining for how I've been getting through this crazy year. Um, but some people weren't so lucky. They were stuck with abusive spouses or children with abusive you know, parents. So they didn't have the ability to get away to go to school or get away to go to work because everyone was stuck at home. Homelessness, sudden or prolonged. Perfectionism, especially for our students, our youth, our teens who are trying to get into colleges, maybe to better their socioeconomic status, or our college students who can only play football if they keep a certain GPA. That perfectionism can be dangerous if it's not kept in check and if people don't learn to give themselves a breather, a break, it's okay. Stress, I think we all know that that is a risk factor for so many things in our lives. And loss. Loss here can mean a couple of different things. So I already mentioned homelessness. It could be financial loss or loss of freedom. Um, like I was mentioning a little bit before, the, the external factors or the situational uh, things that can come up that can lead to thoughts of suicide. So for loss, let's think of a, a prominent businessman, right, who it's been found that his business has been unlawfully run for years, and now he's facing jail time. He's made bail. And what do we sometimes hear in the news? That that person has now died by suicide before he had to go back to jail because he could no longer stand his whole image being run through the mud, his, his company being demolished, his family being in the news every day, right? So sometimes that person may have never been diagnosed with any mental illness, but that situation backed him into a corner and that was the only way he saw to get out. A decline in health, which or a recent medical diagnosis, sometimes you see that as well. Someone might think about suicide because they don't have the money to pay for the medical bills. They don't want their family to go through that stress. Lack of sleep is huge. I don't know about you guys, but after I had my children and I wasn't sleeping because they weren't sleeping and I was up all night rocking them, my thoughts were weird. <laughs> so if we're not sleeping, we're not thinking right. We are not ourselves. So anyone who's not sleeping, we should be checking on them. LGBTQ community is definitely uh, at risk simply because of understanding and acceptance, especially if someone doesn't have a family, it's going to accept uh, their differences and embrace it or a community that's not going to. There's definitely concern that someone can feel alienated, alienated and isolated. If someone close to us dies by suicide, especially if it's a child, uh, if a parent dies by suicide, that person is at a higher risk. A history of attempts. If someone has made suicide attempts in the past, what that's showing us is that suicide has become part of their coping mechanisms. They are using the thought that, well, if this doesn't work out, I could just kill myself anyway. They're using that as a coping mechanism. It's not a good one, but it is a coping mechanism. Just like self-injurious behavior is a coping mechanism. And I will caveat that with you, typically self-injurious behavior does not have the intent to die. So it wouldn't be um, considered a suicide attempt, but you do definitely have to ask someone if they are engaging in that behavior. Trauma is, a, is, I think all of us hopefully recognize that any type of trauma and it's trauma that the person feels. It doesn't, I might not think that something is a traumatic event, but if that person feels that it is and it's impacting their mental health, that is a huge risk factor. PTSD for our, our veterans or our police officers. Access to lethal means, which I mentioned before, that is huge, huge for first degree, second degree, third degree, any type of suicide attempt. 
access to lethal means is a huge risk factor. Prescription drug side effects. I don't know about you guys, but um, it kind of pains me to know that we are the only country that has prescription drug uh, medication commercials on TV. And that bothers me for a multitude of reasons, but one of them, if you pay attention to the next one that you listen to, and it's any type of uh, drug, not just for mental health, any. There's fast talk at the end or very small writing at the bottom. And it says, typically, if you're having uh, thoughts of hurting yourself or others or depression or hopelessness or thoughts of suicide, contact your doctor and stop taking. I mentioned this one because in one of the books I've read in preparing to provide these trainings, there was a very long story about a woman who lost her husband because he did die by suicide. She knew he had changed after taking a medication, but didn't think that they were correlated right? Um, and this was kind of in the beginning, I think, when we were all realizing that our prescri prescription drugs have a lot of side effects. So just keep in mind, it's totally okay to ask people if they start a new medication, if it's, you know, one of your loved ones and you're aware to ask how they're feeling on it. Bullying is also huge. I have it on there. I know I said I was focusing on uh, adults, but in my opinion, bullying happens into adulthood. We, not all of us grow out of it, unfortunately, but especially for our teens and our kids. Bullying is on the internet now. It's happening on Instagram. It's happening on Facebook. It's happening when they're playing, you know, their games. You can't get away from it. When I was younger, bullied at school, I came home to a loving family. I was good. It's not happening as much anymore. They can still get to you. So the fact that it's never ending makes someone feel like they can't get away from it. So bullying is huge. Huge, huge. So again, I mentioned before, but I did want to still have this caveat here. Uh, or disclaimer for risk factors that anyone, no matter what category, gender, race, socioeconomic status, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, can fall victim to suicide. It doesn't discriminate. So that's why it's really hard to always pick up on it because it can be literally anyone. It could even be me, I'm talking about it and I could be struggling with these thoughts, right? Could have all this knowledge and you don't know. So the next is warning signs, and this is what you're going to look for. So if you know that some of those risk factors are present for someone, you would also look for these warning signs, disheveled or lack of care. So hair sticking up, maybe also, you know, an odor to them, or it's clear someone's not taking care of themselves. I mentioned not sleeping, um, but it could also be somebody sleeping too much. So maybe somebody's just sleeping the day away and not doing anything that they enjoy doing anymore. Like I just said, no longer enjoying anything talking about dying or suicide. I think that there is uh, a lot of myths around that where people say, oh, if somebody talks about that they want to die by suicide, they're not going to do anything. There are people who talk about it and then never actually carry out an attempt. But that's expressing discomfort and pain in and of itself and still needs to be addressed. But people who go on to make an attempt or die by suicide, there is evidence that they did talk about it beforehand. So even if someone's joking, even if someone's saying, oh, huh, I won't be here next week to do that anyway, you need to be concerned, especially if you see these other things. So always listen and be very attentive. Recent loss of any kind, I mentioned that before, job, relationship, or death of someone, fear of becoming a burden to others is what goes along with that uh, diagnosis of a medical situation. Purchasing gun or drugs, you know, I have friends that I know who like to go hunting. And if they tell me they purchased a new gun, no problem. If someone else in my life, a couple of my friends said that they went to go purchase a gun, I would hold up a second. Why do you need that? And there would be a long discussion. So all of these things are going to be within the realm of what you know about the person and how close you are to the person. Um, not all of these are warning signs for everyone. Expressing hopelessness, helplessness, or despair, giving away possessions, especially if you are giving away, anyone is giving away pets, because as you'll see on the next slide, they are a huge protective factor. Uh, getting personal affairs in order, I mentioned that earlier as part of preparatory behavior. So that would most likely go along with someone who was planning to die by suicide for a long time. A change in interest or belief in religion or higher power. So if you have a friend who's very religious and stops going to church, you might be concerned why they all of a sudden have lost their faith and vice versa. Someone who never before talked about the afterlife or God or anything, and now that's all they're talking about, you should maybe be concerned about that as well. 
isolation is huge. I know we're all kind of isolated from the pandemic, but if this person wasn't even having Zoom calls or FaceTime or picking up the phone or texting you back, that's a concern. I have saying goodbye on here. Because uh, I don't know about you guys, but if you get a weird phone call from a friend you haven't talked to in a long time, or just a conversation that feels like someone's saying goodbye, or just saying, I'm sorry. Well, for what? Oh, don't worry about it. Just know that I'm sorry. That's someone reaching out and they're trying to tell you something. This is also happening more on social media, Instagram posts, Facebook. Uh, personally, a friend of mine who I did lose to suicide a year ago, um, she did put her goodbye on Facebook. And, you know, that's painful because that's still there. We can all go back and look at it. Um, and that's how, you know, social media and things like that have changed our world. Everything is out there all the time. So saying goodbye is very concerning. Keep your eyes out for that. And this last one, suddenly calm. So if someone who has been having distress and troubles and struggles and expressing hopelessness is now all of a sudden calm and happy, you should be very concerned. That means that person has made their choice. They are going to die by suicide. They know how, they know when it's done in their mind. Everything else you've seen up to that point is an ambivalence, a back and forth of should I stay, should I go, should I live, should I die, what should I do? That suddenly calm means that they've made their choice. There is still time to turn that around, but that means at the end, we're getting to the end here and we really need to intervene if we haven't before. So these warning signs can be present without someone contemplating suicide, yes. However, the presence of multiple signs often indicates a suicide crisis or some other mental health crisis. And it's better to ask, ask about them than to ignore them because asking that question will save someone's life. I don't know about you, but I needed a breath there. So protective factors, supportive family, friends, and loved ones, people who will listen, children, especially for females, I say children are a huge protective factor. Pets, 100%. I don't know about you guys, but I adore my dogs and I would never, ever leave them. <laughs> uh, a positive social network. I have positive there because as we know, not all of us have friends who are maybe such positive influences. And if you are struggling, you want to make sure that you narrow that down to have a positive social network of people who are going to help you with self-help and coping strategies or who are going to listen to you when you're struggling and who are going to be there and they're not going to judge you. You want to have a safety plan. I've had discussions about safety plan with a number of people. Uh, I personally feel that we should all have safety plans, whether we're thinking about suicide or not. And I think unofficially, a lot of us do, right? I know if I'm struggling, I need to go for a walk by myself or listen to music or go for a run or meditate or go do something fun with my family, right? or I need a good night's sleep that maybe I haven't gotten in a while. But we all know, or you know the people you can call if you're struggling. So a protective factor is having either official or an unofficial safety plan. You know what to do when you're struggling. Another protective factor is difficult access to means. This one can be tough at times, especially if it's someone who's an avid gun owner or a war vet who just feels more comfortable with their gun at their side or in their home. But and I keep talking about guns because guns are the most lethal means of suicide. And if someone does choose to use a gun uh, to end their life, it is more often than not going to be successful. And if it's, I know I wasn't going to say successful and unsuccessful, but if it is unsuccessful, um, they are left with permanent damage. So we do want to reduce someone's access to their gun if they are feeling suicidal. We want to make it difficult by any means for them to get that thing together to use it. Thoughts of suicide last about 10 minutes. That, that severe desire to end your life lasts about 10 minutes. If you can't get your gun together or you can't get all those pills together, you're going to be alive at the end of those 10 minutes to call the person on your safety plan. You're going to realize that what your thoughts are doing and you're going to be able to interrupt them and reach out for help. 
So difficult access to means. If someone's amenable to it, giving their guns to friends to hold on to while they're feeling this way. Uh, one creative solution was a man who said, I can't get rid of my gun, but I will put the gun locked up in a cabinet in that room. And then I will take it apart and with the bullets and I will freeze them in water in the refrigerator in my garage that's also locked. So by the time he would be done chipping the ice away or melting that ice to then put the gun together to then end his life, his thoughts of suicide would be over. So you see what we're saying with that? And that was a plan that that man developed with the help of his uh, professionals and with, with his uh, therapist. Anyone who's struggling with this crisis has to be involved in that plan. So that was his plan to keep himself safe. It's important as a protective factor that we have something to believe in. I don't care what we call it. We can call it, uh, I think one book I was reading, uh, she was referring to as the divine or the universe or God or anything. But if we believe in something, that's a huge protective factor. Hope in and of itself that tomorrow will be a better day and the next day will be better and the next day will be better is a protective factor. Knowing that there's meaning or purpose in our life, whether it's our job or us raising our children or how much we're there for our friends or volunteer work that we do, that purpose keeps us here day in and day out. Good health. When your body feels good, you mentally feel good, emotionally you feel good, and you're moving. Positive self-esteem. That one's tough at times, but positive self-esteem definitely keeps us here each and every day. For those of us who need medication to help our brains uh, function, staying compliant helps us be here each and every day. Uh, a sidebar to that is I personally look at the brain as another organ in our body, just like our, we could have diabetes, right? And we need to take medication to regulate that. If we have heart disease, it's our heart needing a little bit of extra help from medication to help it function. So it's the same thing with the brain. So I, for one, don't understand the stigma that if someone's having an issue with their brain that's an organ in their body, why are we blaming them? Let's help them do this. Let's help them see what needs to be done to uh, help it function properly, the neurons, the serotonin, whatever it might be. That's not someone's fault that that's not working. So medication compliance really helps people to think more clearly and have their brains function properly. Mental health treatment, therapy does wonders. It opens up things that people didn't realize happened to them in their lives and helps them deal with them because trauma is real. Trauma can sit in your body before you vocalize about it, before you talk to anyone about it, and it can be there without you knowing it, eating away at you. Um, individual and family or group therapy. I'm a firm believer in, in everyone's mental health is a different recipe, right? We all have a different way of protecting ourselves from thinking about suicide, from depression, or from just having a bad day. And this is how we can do it. So again, I do want to just have a little side thought of a person can have all of these protective factors and still die by suicide because suicide is a journey and it pulls and ebbs and flows. And unfortunately, the lethal act can be a result of impulsive decision. So someone can have all of this in place and they could have one bad day. And unfortunately, we can lose someone to suicide still. So I'm going to say again, all we can do is the best we can each and every day to, for ourselves and for each other. So that's where this slide comes in. I don't know if you guys recognize this man. Well, it says his name there too. It's Heath Ledger. Um, he was a phenomenal actor, but he also openly uh, was struggling with mental health issues. I believe ultimately the judgment was that it was an accidental overdose, but we don't know. Uh, so this is a quote from him that everyone you meet always asks if you have a career or married or own a house as if life was some kind of grocery list, but no one ever asks you if you are happy. We do that, right? We say, oh, hey, how are you today? I'm great. Bye. That's it. So my question is, do all of us on this call right now have someone who we can truly be honest with when they ask us how we are today? I do. I need it. That's really, really important, especially for someone who's struggling with suicide. They need to know that there are people they can talk to who are not afraid of their scariest thoughts. 
And if you're one of those people, uh, something you can say to them is that if suicide crosses your mind, just know I'd rather listen to your story than attend your funeral. Because that's the reality, right? We all need to have these people that we can talk to and people who are struggling need us so they can do that as well. I'm not saying you can like be open with everybody about how you're doing that day, like not the cashier at the food store or Target. Have certain people. That's not the time to do it. Okay. Okay. So prevention. Here's a little bit of what we do at Seeing Guidance. Uh, we have been on a zero suicide methodology for at least five years now. It was something that uh, when I joined the agency, we were working on. And what we do is we use an evidence-based tool called the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. We use it at intake with all of our programs, whether it's clinical or not, because it is a very easy tool to use. Uh, it's very specific about suicide, about thoughts, how long you've been thinking them, have you made an attempt in the past? And it really does open someone up to tell what's going on, to tell their story as far as their thoughts of suicide. So we do it at intake for all programs, and we also do it quarterly thereafter, or unless something comes up that, such as the warning signs or risk factors that I mentioned before, that would trigger us to do it again. If someone completes the Columbia and it indicates that they are actively suicidal or thinking about suicide on a regular basis, we put them on the suicide care pathway. What that includes is weekly clinical appointments, weekly Columbias that are done, and additional outreach. Due to COVID, some of that looks a little bit differently. We used to actually go out to the person's home to see why they didn't make it to their appointment. Everything is mostly telehealth at this point, as most of the world is. So there are extra calls and just extra outreach in that way or to family members we have consent to speak to, to try to connect to this person. So that's as an agency overall. This next slide goes into what my team through the grant does specifically. Now, this is open to not just people who receive services from CN Guidance. This can include anyone that you on this call right now knows who might be struggling with suicide. My grant team can wrap around and support them. So adults age 25 and older in Nassau and Suffolk County who are struggling with uh, or having concerns surrounding suicide uh, especially as a result of the pandemic, can receive a care manager or outreach specialist, additional clinical services specialist, and a peer specialist. And we will be there just to support them. And this slide goes through that. We are text messaging, just calling and listening, because that is key. When someone is talking to you about a problem, they are not looking for solutions. They just want someone to listen. So that is our kind of motto when it comes to this. We're there to listen just to be there for the person who's struggling. I know that clinical appointments are only a certain amount of time, other therapy sessions only a certain amount of time. We are a little more flexible, right? We're not working on designated plans. Um, we're doing whatever the person needs from us. We also do something called caring messages, which is sending just positive affirmations, reminding somebody like, hey, it's a beautiful day out. It's getting warmer, let's go for a walk. We do discuss their safety plan and go over it, make sure they have it accessibly. We talk about family support. Uh, I actually have a quote from a mom that one of my team members spoke to recently. Uh, her teenage daughter has made multiple attempts since the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And she said, you are the rainbow and ray of sunshine that I needed during this difficult time. Just from my staff outreaching to her to say, hey, you know, I want to talk to you. I, I'm here for your daughter. I'm just here for you guys to call, to talk about what's going on, to get you more connected to the community, link and refer beyond what, you know, our, the therapy services are already doing. Um, I also want to mention when we're doing uh, our calls, we also do the Columbia through the grant as well. So this was the response we got from someone else that we're supporting from the grant. She said, I am in an abusive relationship with my husband and am extremely depressed. I would have never told anyone or expressed my thoughts of suicide to anyone if I didn't receive this call. I'm so very happy that there is extra support out there for people like me who are struggling with suicide and depression. So I hope that that gives you that picture that talking about suicide 
it doesn't make people angry for the most part. For the most part, it helps people to just breathe. I can share this with someone who's not afraid of my scary thoughts. So that's what we're there for as the grant. We are those people to this person, especially if they feel like they're a burden to their family by constantly talking about how hopeless and depressed they are. Diana, so those two, yes. We have a question in the chat. Uh, the question is, it's a great one. It reads, what can employers do to help their employees who may be suffering from suicidal thoughts? Employers. I know that at CNG, we have an employee assistance program that our staff can access anonymously um, and receive therapy and, you know, and get access to treatment that way. Um, I can only speak for us at, at CN Guidance, you know, as a suggestion. We also are going through, you know, I as a supervisor, trauma-informed training for how to be a manager in that way. Um, I think the more that we realize that it's not just people we're supporting, uh, it's also ourselves who've dealt with trauma or had these thoughts, especially with this pandemic. So just responding to people with that care and understanding. Um, but the employee assistance program, I know, is, is, is a huge assistance when people are feeling, feeling this way and allowing them to use PTO, things like that. Just being supportive. I hope that answered. <laughs> And also, I'll go into my next slide, which is actually part of the grant as well. So also allowing people, people to attend a training such as this, right? To understand that suicide is out there, it's thought about, it's, it's normal for lack of a better word. Um, because you guys might be thinking, oh, you gave us all this information, what do we do with this now? How do I talk to somebody who's thinking this way? So I can also offer other free training either to any of you who want to contact me directly or if you want to set it up through, you know, as part of uh, your workplace, everybody wants to come. So I would suggest mental health first aid or QPR for suicide prevention. So mental health first aid is a longer day and there's more uh, information in that one. Um, there's pre-work, which is okay. It's really, really informative. And it talks about how to support anyone in any type of mental health crisis, from having a panic attack to suicidal thoughts to uh, psychosis. It comes from a general public perspective. So it's not how to do it as a clinician, if anyone on the call is in that role, it's more how to do it as someone out in the public helping a friend, family, neighbor, loved one. Same thing with QPR for suicide prevention. It's also a general public training, uh, but that one is a shorter training and it is focused just on suicide prevention. So kind of going over these risk factors and warning signs that I went over today, but then talking about how to question someone and how to listen to someone and persuade them and refer them to services. Lastly, there's also, uh, I didn't mention it before, but we all are also partnered with the Safe Center on Long Island, which is a domestic violence uh, response agency. They work with anyone who's suffering uh, in a situation of domestic violence or rape, sexual assault victims. They have legal, you know, help to address legal matters. They're very robust in their services that they can offer as well. Did the chat go off again or are we good? There is a comment and okay. it states Thrive NYC. As another resource. Oh, someone raised their hand. Um, question. Yes. Um, I know college is like very, very stressful and depending on the person's major or their field, there's no room for errors and it's very competitive. So has your program heard with any university in Long Island or in general? It actually enforces on quite prevalent depending on the campus that you're at. Martina, I, I heard the foundation of a great question. You did cut out a few times. A part of the question I heard you ask was, has your organization, meaning CN Guidance and Counseling, partnered with any universities on Long Island? Um, would you want to try to ask your, your full question again? Oh, no, that was the question. <laughs> okay, okay, awesome. 
I think I think we did. We got the we got the best parts of it. It, it kind of eked out. Um, so I mean, what we're doing right now, you know, me working with Tony is definitely part of that. And there's definitely other things um, in discussion. And I have reached out to other colleges as well uh, with recognizing that, you know, even when I went to college and I was able to go to my classes, you know, in person, it's even more stressful now. How our education is all kind of mixed up with who's able to be on site, who's not, who's doing it virtually. So I have reached out uh, to some and I'm waiting to hear back, but I am in agreement that this training and this discussion is definitely important for assisting our young adults who are going to college right now. Thank you again, Martina. That was a great question. Yes, thank you. Um, and we're certainly looking forward to continuing partnering with CN Guidance in uh, in the future. And Diana, I wanted to let you know, we have another question in the chat. Okay. This question asks, where can we sign up for the additional trainings that you just referenced? All you have to do is email me or call me. Very and easy. Your contact is at the bottom of each At the bottom, the yep. So email me or call me. Uh, if it's for you individually or for a group, we'll figure it out. I'm pretty flexible. Um, but yeah, my goal is just to get everyone comfortable talking about suicide so we can all be part of the prevention, a part of the discussions. I see some things coming in. So in addition to those trainings that I can provide. There's some free trainings listed here as well. Nowmattersnow.org is very good. SAMHSA, like I said, that is our funder for the grant that I have, has some free online information. COM is also good. It's a longer training, but I would do the two bolded trainings for free for whoever wanted to attend. I think there are more questions, right? There are comments. Oh, of comments. <laughs> you, you have received comments of thanks from oh. the dean of our school, Dr. Holly Syrup. Oh, thank you. And from Martina, who asked one of the questions, yes. and from additional audience members oh, as well. Thank you. So I let Tony know um, kind of these slides, this last one that I had. Oh, lying. Starting here, I do have them all in a Word document that I that I will send, um, so you guys can have all these resources. So if before you come to my training, you encounter someone who's struggling, you could definitely help them call the suicide prevention lifeline. So you don't need to write it down. I will make sure you guys get this. This is also a local number response crisis center. Uh, the executive director, Merrill Cassidy, is also one of the co-chairs uh, for the Suicide Prevention Coalition of Long Island. And is extremely knowledgeable in this area. So this is another resource if anyone's struggling. As I mentioned before, we are partnered with the Safe Center for this grant because we do recognize that anyone who is in an abusive situation is struggling even more than the rest of us. Um, so we are partnered with them and working together collectively with certain people, making referrals back and forth, and they are a wonderful grant partner to work with. So you can reach out to them if you need anything for anyone or for yourself. And here's just some additional phone numbers. There's national, there's also the text, there's one for uh, veterans, a Spanish speaking line, Spanish, I can't speak right now, Spanish speaking line, sorry about that. Um, there's also local phone numbers that you can call. DASH is also there. They're a great resource and can help to provide an assessment if someone's not currently enrolled uh, in, in clinical treatment. And this is actually the list of books that a lot of my knowledge and things I've said and uh, some statistics and some things have come from. So this will be a part of the list as well. I know some of you are you know, in college now already doing a ton of reading, but this is additional reading if you want it, and it is not light reading. It is sometimes uh, upsetting. So please only read them if you feel you can. And here's some websites and apps 
Uh, My strength is something that and as an agency we use both for our staff members. So that question of how an, an employer can help their staff. Uh, we do use my strength. We recommend that staff log in. It logs your sleeping, how you're feeling, gives some ideas about um, nutrition. And there's a lot of different things you can read about meditation and things like that. And actually, I can continue that question with how employers can help. I didn't even think about it. I am the co-chair for the Total Wellness Committee at CN Guidance. And one thing that myself and my colleague, uh, Caitlin Roeder did as soon as the pandemic started and we realized that our staff was all going to be home and separate is we started doing virtual events, coffee breaks where we could all log in and chat. Um, right now there's an amazing support group that goes on Tuesday nights um, that one of our staff runs and it just took on a life of its own and they are, the emails they write to each other are just beautiful about how much they are supporting each other. Um, We had yoga classes, we have meditation sessions, um, we send out recommended Netflix, you know, movies or TV shows to watch, recommended books to read. So we really did a lot to pull ourselves together, even though we were all physically separate. Um, I also do something called a virtual awesome board. So everybody emails me thanks or uh, just great job on this, you know, or just different things to thank each other. You know, especially if you have a, a mutual client and you're emailing back and forth and you achieve something, you know, it goes out on the awesome board and it's, it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun to put together. So even those things are also things that employers can do just regarding mental health for their staff um, in general, especially during this time. So that was a sidebar. Um, and yeah, so here's a lot of websites and apps that can be used to look up more resources and to just kind of fill your toolbox um, if the thoughts of suicide from friends, friends, families, loved ones, anyone you work with come across your way. So Diana, excuse me, there is one question which I actually think you just covered in your your most recent response. The question asked, are are there free virtual resources from CN Guidance? Well, it wouldn't be from me, but ones that I found in preparing myself for uh, providing these trainings and educating myself. So yeah, I will send those out. Nowmattersnow.org was really, really good. It was really good. I like that, that website a lot. It does go over some DBT skills and things that I actually use as well, even just to maintain myself. <laughs> Excellent. And you, you have a comment that states, according to Durkheim's analysis, this presentation rocked. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I have now this last uh, request of all of you. Try saying nothing negative for 24 hours straight and watch your life change. That's my my self-care plug. Uh, I was telling Tony earlier that I, I did this presentation and I had somebody literally cackle, like laugh out loud when I put this up. And she was just like, you know, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Okay. <laughs> Try doing it. It feels good. You know, our brains listen to us and the words that come out of our mouth, even when we think it's not. So if you can learn to rephrase things more positively, it does help to change the way you think about things. So do this for yourself, not for me. 